Your Honor, I would like to call the State versus City of Natchitoches versus Travis Hines. Mr. Hines, come forward. Good morning, sir. You can feel free to set up a chair if you'd like, sir. Okay, set up a chair if I'd like. If you'd like, or you can stand. I can... I can sit. That's fine. So in this matter, I have received a number of motions. So I'm going to take them all as we go, and I believe the state has filed some motions as well and some responsive pleadings to what you have filed. So to do this orderly, I'm going to go ahead and take each one as they were filed and then, please, when you file a motion, I don't sign motions without a contradictory hearing, meaning that I expect both of you to come forward and say what you have to say. So when you do submit a motion, I won't add an order to set it for a date, which I have done here today. So in this matter, the first motion you have filed, sir, is a motion to dismiss. You filed that on January 31st, I believe it is. Your argument, sir, it's your motion. Well, the motion, I want to say, stands on its own. Okay. But I can add that I do have other court cases I'd like to add to the argument. Okay. And this is on the motion to dismiss? Your first motion you filed back in January. Correct. Okay. I request that this court make a ruling on the lawful nature of my arrest. This is a matter of law. The cases I'd like to add are White v. Morris from 1977, and I don't know how much background the court would like on that. A police officer sued somebody he was arresting. He got punched, his jaw was broken, and he sued the arrestee. And there was some, the decision that came out of that I fa in favor of the defendant. And also Louisiana versus Timmy Hill in 1998. Police cannot search the, the defendant without reasonable cause. Johnson v. Thibodeau City in 2018. Police cannot arrest over ID. And then Miller v. U.S. from 1956. An exercise of a constitutional right cannot be converted to a crime. And then Brandon Trahan v. City of Scott, out of the Third Circuit, 2001. A private investigator was approached by the police and they demanded his ID without without reasonable uh, without good re without reasonable cause and he later sued those the police department and won for that uh, for being demanded of his ID without reasonable cause and then in the Louisiana Constitution I don't believe that was added oh it is under section 5 we have a right to privacy and to be secure in our persons property papers against unreasonable searches also, there was a court case, Brown v. Texas, in 1971. An El Paso man was stopped with no reasonable suspicion. It was a Fourth Amendment violation there as well. So my motion to dismiss, I mean, I'm not, the library incident involved, involves a constitutional protection, and I make arguments in favor of my constitutional protection. My constitutional rights supersede police policies which I don't know if the prosecution wants to use any police policies as part of their argument, but if they do, I need to see these, the police policies. I am having a lot of difficulty getting that. I'm also having difficulty getting, like, discovery evidence. We'll get to those. That's different? You have separate motions. Oh, okay. So the motion to dismiss... Mr. Benjamin, he has presented. That was the first motion he has filed. I have received a copy of your motion to quash, his motion to dismiss. What is your position on this? Your Honor, I think that Mr. Hines mentioned his motion to dismiss, was then evolved into a constitutional discussion. Clearly and squarely, just if you take his motion to dismiss, it's without merit. It's not provided for in the Louisiana law criminally. We don't recognize a motion to dismiss. That's something that's germane to a civil proceeding. 
His vehicle is a motion to quash and the grounds for motion to quash in the Code of Criminal Procedure, Article 535, are really specific. A motion to quash may be filed at any time right before the commencement of trial for number one, if the offense charged is not punishable under valid statute, number two, the indictment does not conform with the requirements of chapter two of the Constitution, number three, the trial for the offense charged will constitute double jeopardy, number four, the time limitation for the institution of the prosecution has expired, number five, the court has no jurisdiction of the offense charged, number six, the Information of charges on the offense in which the prosecution instituted was not brought by a grand jury indictment. Number seven, the individual charged with violation of uniform controlled dangerous substance law has a valid prescription for that substance. These grounds may be urged at any stage. That is his proper vehicle to be urged in a motion to quash. For that reason alone, it should be dismissed because it's the improper vehicle. But, with respect, he did go into some constitutional law. We're not here to argue the merits of his case today. So I think he's a little bit confused. We're not here to argue his merits of whether or not there was reasonable suspicion to stop him, and to, but, because it's a trial issue, then the law stands on its own. So Louisiana Code of, of Criminal Procedure Article 215 basically indicates a law enforcement officer may stop a person in a public place whom he reasonably suspects is committing, has committed. So that's one, is, number two, has, number three, or about to commit an offense. I'm going to stop you right there for a second. I'm trying to take these each of these as they come. So I'd like to what you have filed, that's your next motion, I seems like to respond to his motion to, so here's my position. Is there anything else you want to present on your initial motion to dismiss that you filed, the one that you filed in January? Well, I just want to reiterate that I request the court to make a ruling on the lawful nature of my arrest. Well, and here's my position on this. Reading your motion, the first paragraph on your motion to dismiss states that, in essence, that the statute is unconstitutional. I don't find it as on its face unconstitutional based on various cases such as Terry Stops, under, Terry v. Ohio, State of Ohio v. Supreme Court. So I don't the law fails on its face, which is your first request under this, motion to dismiss. The second, paragraphs 2 through 10, the problem with this is something actually that Mr. Benjamin alluded to. There are facts that are very specific to this case. This court can't make a ruling on evidence that's not in front of it, and so there has been no evidence presented to me on except for what y'all filed in motions and paperwork on what actually happened at that event. Clearly, you have a different opinion than what happened and what occurred and the state is having an opinion on what occurred. That has to be proven to me by evidence meaning whether it's testimonial or whether it's physical evidence, or whatever. It would be difficult for me to try to rule on something that I don't have evidence. Otherwise, you're just telling me, this was wrong, and this is what happened. And he's saying, it was right, and this is what happened. Y'all aren't evidence. Evidence is witnesses and physical evidence that comes in the record. So I think your motion to dismiss is premature just in this process. Now, at some point, you could reiterate it, perhaps after a trial or even after some of the evidence is taken. But, at this point, I think your initial motion is premature, because there is nothing in evidence that can say whether or not this was an illegal arrest or what have you. So I'm going to deny your initial motion to dismiss. That is just number one. The second motion that you have filed is a motion, well, it was called, Law and Argument. The, Law and Argument, is, I'm assuming, a motion to allow a recording device is really what it is. So that is the one that's titled, Law and Argument. Yes, sir. Okay. That's the one I'm looking at now. So tell me what you want from that. Well, uh, that's, that's more like a... I look at it as more of a third party asking as a third party. Just, I stand on the arguments. But I mean, uh, it doesn't really have, uh, like, direct application to this case. It's... No but it has, it's something you filed, so we have to address it. Yes, uh, yes sir. I'm requesting your honor 
if you would allow recording in the court. Mr. Benjamin, your response to that? Your Honor, obviously, a decision such as allowing recordation is purely in the purview of the court. However, we would find it objectionable because there are no courts in this parish that actually utilize recordation. However, that's a judicial decision. Okay. Based upon your rules, we would, obviously, have security concerns. If I take you back for a moment, the reason that we don't allow cell phones in the courtroom is because one day we were here in this particular courtroom, and I remember quite vividly a gentleman standing out there trying to live stream what was going on and carrying on a fiasco on a Facebook Live. That's the reason we don't even allow that. So there are all kinds of questions of security. And, you know, it's pretty well and widely respected in the entirety of the court system that, you know, recordation devices just aren't allowed in court. Lawyers, in some federal courts, we actually check our phones and before we go in, and we're officers of the court. So I don't know what makes Mr. Travis Hines any different. So we would think that that's just over the top, but however, it's up to the court's purview. I have read again your motion, Mr. Hines, and you are correct. You have a right to a speedy trial, which usually is meant for those languishing in jail, but you do have a right to this, and I hope you appreciate we did set this with this hearing within two weeks of your filing. And you do have a right to a public trial. This is a public trial, meaning that as you have people who are obviously sitting at court not a part of your case, people are welcome to come and watch this. This is a public trial. Regarding if we have issues of the fire marshal and there are too many people in court, sometimes we can't have everybody in court that we want to. But the Waller analysis you get to is different. The Waller analysis is actually, Waller vs. Georgia out of I'm sorry, Waller vs. Georgia out of the Supreme Court that was actually a wiretap case. And what had happened in that matter was that the police had wanted to put on wiretap evidence, and the court closed the courtroom to everybody except for the parties and the court personnel in order that they would preserve the people who were using wiretaps and hope to use them again in a future time. Afterwards, the court found that it wasn't necessary to have done it. Actually, the local court didn't, the Supreme Court did, and overruled it, and said it should not have been closed. We're not closing this courtroom. Your hearing is open to whoever wants to come in, again, regarding issues of safety, if there is too many people in this room. But they're welcome to come in. So I'm not going to close your courtroom, but on the other hand, I can't record it. And one of the reasons I can't allow recording is that I am bound by the Code of Judicial Ethics. There is a Code of Judicial Ethics that the Supreme Court makes me swear to when I swore in last year, or actually, the year before, in that canon. There are canons that say what you shall and shall not do. There is a canon under the Code of Judicial Ethics that says a judge shall prohibit broadcasting, television, recording, taking photographs in the courtroom and areas immediately adjacent thereto during sessions of court or recesses between sessions. In other words, at any time, so I am bound by that code, sir, and so, as a result, I do not allow recording. That's what I swore that I would not do and I do not see any exception or reason for an exception in this matter. So we do record everything that's in this room. We have had appeals before in this, not many, but we have appeals in this matter. If so, this court will transcribe it, and you'll have access to that to provide any kind of appellate argument you may have at that time, so I'm going to deny your motion for recording. The next matter you have is a, the state actually moved to move this arraignment arraignment to today. It was originally set for May 10th, and they've asked to move it today. I did not order that it would be today. I merely moved that they wanted to have it today. You have filed a motion to oppose that arraignment today. Tell me about that. The motion, the response in opposition to motion and order to set matter for arraignment, I stand on what I wrote. This is other matters, there is other matters to attend to before the arraignment. Uh, that and that involves the discovery so I there is a court rule 10.1 where the parties get together and establish like within five days a meeting where they share discovery information and I attempted that I walked into the district attorney's office and tried to schedule something and I had no response I will tell you that again 
we do not have to have the arraignment today. We don't have to, but it does create a delay, and I don't know if that's what you want, you know, personally. I have no idea, because I know you don't live here, but that's up to you. If you want to delay the arraignment, that's between y'all. If there's an agreement to that, that's fine. The arraignment was originally set for May 10th, so I don't know why the state wanted to move it up, but they chose to move it up to today, or asked to be moved to today. We can just as well leave it on May 10th. We could move it to another day that's agreeable to the parties. It does not have to be held today. So that's strictly a choice. You can certainly argue if you want, but we don't have to have the arraignment today. Judge, the state joined with an agreement. I thought that, I thought that he wanted to go ahead and get these matters rocking and rolling and get it completed. To move your arraignment to, May, would just kind of pulls it on out and rolls it on out, which is senseless. If I may jump ahead just, I mean, I have all of his discovery here. Well, that's good. Now, that's, he's correct. Those are issues, Mr. Hines. Those are issues that you want to address and see what they have and they get to see what you have. There is no... Not yet. Oh. In Louisiana, there is what they call open discovery. In other words, there is no Perry Mason moments. There is no surprises. You ask for what you want. He gets whatever you plan on presenting. But you have a right to delay the arraignment, but I just mentioned that pushing that down moves the proceedings down, and you're welcome to do that. Again, I don't know exactly why they moved it up. It may have been to accommodate you. But at this point, it was originally set for May. So if you want, you're welcome to move that. The, the other thing we can do is because, as you can tell, we have a lot of motions in this matter, and it's a rather crowded courtroom, we're welcome to put it on a special setting. I'll be happy to do that and set it for a day that y'all choose that's not our specific calendar. I have other opportunities to come and meet in here. If y'all have any suggested days, I can set it for that day. We could move the arraignment, and you can go through all the discovery that the pretrial stuff that you may see today, and that may affect your decision on what you want to do in the future. Yes, sir. I'd be happy to accept the discovery now, and then set the matter for a later date. Then let's do that. Let's choose a date, and I'd like to choose one separate since we have, you know, a lot of people, and they have to wait for our case. So is there a specific date, Mr. Benjamin? you can do, or you're available, or you want to handle this matter in the future, and we'll set the arraignment for that date. March 7th or March 8th? Let's see if I can do it. So March 7th, I'm available. If that's what you need. That is a Monday. March 7th would be perfect. Is that okay for you, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll set this for arraignment that day. Now remember, by being an arraignment, usually on an arraignment date, all that is issued is a plea of guilty or not guilty. It's not the actual trial date. So I don't want you to be surprised. I don't want to push this down the road. So I'm trying to accommodate both of y'all and make sure everyone's available when they need to be. So I'll be happy to set the arraignment for March 7th. Again, that's a Monday. We'll do it at 9 o'clock. At that time, like I said, you may choose to do something different. If y'all choose to and communicate with each other and the court, we can have the trial that day as well. If you decide, you know what, we're ready to go, I don't want to delay it anymore, we can do it that day as well. But, for now, we're going to set just the arraignment for the 7th. Yes, sir. Okay, so I'll grant your motion to deny the arraignment that's set today, and I will have it reset for March 7th. If you'll provide Mr. Hines with notice of that date, if you don't mind. Sir, I'd like, I'd like to open up communication between us, too. If? Between the state and yourself, yes. Yes. You can't have any with me. The only time y'all can ever talk with me is like this, when everyone is here. No, outside of court, between me and the prosecution. Certainly. I've been ignored, and... Well, we'll work on that. All right. So again, I'm going to move this to March 7th at 9 o'clock. So the next motion you have set is the motion to quash, again. 
This is the second motion to quash you filed, which is connected to your bill of information. This motion, I'll be honest with you, is very similar to your first motion. Again, I don't feel the statute fails on its face, but again, Mr. Benjamin is going to argue as well. So what is your second motion to quash? It is entitled, Motion to Quash. What do you want to do on that? What is your position? What do I want to do with that, sir? Well, what is your position? My position, it stands on what I have written. What I have submitted to the court. Okay. Is there anything you want to add to that? I have nothing to add. Okay. Mr. Benjamin, you have, you were discussing earlier, you have filed a motion to quash defendant's motion to dismiss, but you've also filed a motion to quash as it relates to the admission, etc. Yes, judge. You were arguing earlier when I interrupted you. Yes, sir. Okay. Quite simply, the state did not the state just articulated the law because, otherwise, we would jump into arguing facts which would prejudice both the state and the gentleman. And I would also ask that any facts that he indicated that they be stricken from the record because they're not before the court. They're not under oath. They've not been given by anyone, and we don't procedurally, that's not something we do. Your Honor should not be plagued with the facts prior, so we just ask that they be stricken. Okay. And secondly, with respect to the statute of, and I'll be just really succinct on this, Article 215.2, as we are indicating, allows an officer to under Terry v. Ohio, which everyone's familiar with, which is a similar case that an officer has a right to approach an individual and ask for their name when they suspect and have reasonable suspicion to believe that this person may be engaged in some kind of criminal activity. And, at that point, they can ask the name. In fact, Louisiana law takes it a step further and has a codified, under LARS 14 108, the Terry rule, that they can ask the name and address of the individual. That's been held as sound under Louisiana law. We have articulated a number of cases here. Like I said, the Fountainhead case is, Terry v. Ohio, the State v. Boss, there are a number. We just offer our entire response to the court for its consideration on that. There has been no question that the United States Supreme Court in U.S. v. Nevada, which was another case very similar to this case, very similar in terms of facts. Police approached an individual, asked them for their name, and that person there was reasonable suspicion, so it was found to be firm, the statute in Nevada. There is no question that our statute is it's firm and constitutional. Now, the other thing is for the court to decide if there was reasonable suspicion to approach him, but there's nothing wrong with the statute, so that's all that we have to say about that. And again, I would agree in that I don't find that statute fails on its face. I don't think it's unconstitutional. And the information that you want to get into, and I'm not going to strike it, because I haven't, I'm not prejudiced by what's in emotion. But my concern is a lot of this is factual based. In other words, the state is alleging there is reasonable suspicion, you are alleging there was not. And the only way for the court to be able to determine that would be to take evidence and hear testimony. The other point, though, that I want to bring out is that Mr. Hines has filed stating that the charge and request from the state for the charge are differently lettered and numbered. Which is correct. But I think it's the way the statute's written. 108 the paragraph is the crime paragraph just explains instances of that crime. And so even though what Mr. Hines is alleging is that the initial arrest was under 108, I think it is, and then the state has filed it as a 108, C. I think it's the same concept that they're not different charges. It's just a clarification is what the part is. In other words, says, you cannot do these things, and then says, and these are what these things are. It kind of explains more than anything. I don't think it's two different charges. But for clarity's sake, the state may want to address why the initial charge is lettered differently than the actual charge you have brought. And judge, the police officer made their arrest. I mean, it's kind of a trial issue, but the state is free, as your honor's aware, to change what the charge is any time. We do it all the time. 
We do it in open court. There's no law that says we can't. No law that says we can't. We change it to fit. There are many times that officers are on the field, write a case, make a charge, and when we get to screen the charge, we think that something else fits better, so we tweak it, and we charge that. That's what prosecutors do anywhere in the country, anywhere in the country. That's what it's about, because we are the final arbiter to make the decision on what's the proper charge to bring before the court. I think... 108 is 108. I think that's my position is that the charge is the charge. I think there's no now. If for some reason they had suggested something totally different from the original charge, I would be concerned. It's the same charge. It's the same construct. It's the same allegation of what occurred or didn't happen. I'm not saying it's accurate. I'm not saying it happened. I'm saying they're alleging the same thing they've alleged from the start. So I'm going to deny it based on the fact, but I do think you still have a right to raise these motions to quash really more of a motion to dismiss after evidence has been taken. And the court may agree with you and say this wasn't appropriate, this was not a reasonable suspicion case, and I may agree with the state. But I will not start to wade into that water until I have evidence in front of me, so I'm going to dismiss that motion. The next motions are all really more procedural. So I want to know how that is going. I know he has, Mr. Benjamin had suggested he has discovery for you today. That is what you requested. Judge, I would like to go on the record. I filed with the court a written response to Bill of Particulars, and this is the entirety of discovery, including all of the things that are being indicated here. My discovery is open. It's always been open. We don't hide the ball. Here it is. Okay. So you have been presented with what he has deemed to be all of the discovery, meaning all of the information they plan to present you at trial. So, I know, clearly, you've just been handed it, so you don't have an opportunity to go through it. You will have time between now and March 7th to determine if you feel there is something lacking, or if you feel something is missing, or you feel there is something off. You can raise that at that time. But it would be unfair for me to ask you now, because you just got handed it. Yes, sir. Now, in response, the state has filed a request for discovery and such. Mr. Benjamin... What is your position on that? Well, if he has anything, I want all the videos he has, all of the things that you have recorded in the library. They are open to discovery because they are done in connection with this case, and we have a right to them, so that's a start. And like I said before, there's no hiding the ball. If you plan on bringing evidence to court and presenting it to me, then you need to present that to the state as well, just like they gave you a package of stuff. And judge, we know we know as a matter of fact that he has aired a number of things. That's all part and parcel of this, and discoverable, and we want that as well. Do you understand what he's asking for? Yes, sir. Okay. Can I respond? Yes, absolutely. Well, first, I'd like to establish the law. I mean, I do have Fifth Amendment and Fourth Amendment rights. Right. On evidence, I don't... I'm not getting hired by the prosecutor to do their work for them. No, but if you plan on presenting evidence, you need he needs just like they had to give you what they have, and they what he apparently has given you, and I have no idea what's in that package. But what he has given you is what he intends to present when he has witnesses come to this chair, when he has evidence to present to this court. So what he's saying is, you need to present him what you have to present to the court. Yes. Ahead of time. Not the day of court. I don't again, that's surprise stuff. That doesn't occur in Louisiana. When people ask for their discovery, even in civil cases, but here definitely in criminal cases, he has a right to ask anything you plan to present ahead of time. So what I would ask, I would order you to do is present him what videos you have to present him for his preparation. Because he has a right to look at them and argue whatever he's going to do before we go to trial. Yes, sir. So you do have to present that to him. Is there any documents or anything like that you plan on presenting? You don't have to tell me what they are, but you need to get them to Mr. Benjamin. And I would like to open up a dialogue between us. You should. If we could share email and... You can do that. 
email is fair. That may be the easier way of him getting the videos to you. I have the original videos I intend to share in during trial, and I'd like to share that. I don't have, I don't know if you gave me a CD. I don't have any way to play CDs. Okay. But I have a thumb drive. I could. So what you have are thumb drives. So he has a. I don't have. This is what I'll tell you what you have. You have everything that I have, and you have, you have thumb drives, you have police camera video, you have reports. They're all indicated on the bill of particulars if you look back, but you have several of those. So I'm not required to print it out for you, to print it out. It's a lot of information. But you have the thumb drive and you have an actual CD for which you can go and review on any computer or any laptop anywhere. But that's the totality of what the state has. Are you able to access a computer to be able to? Well, I'd have to see what the library offers for playing CDs. Okay. But usually they don't. But they do. But is the CD different from the thumb drive? Yes. I'm asking. It's different information, I believe. Okay. And, look, the gentleman's a very highly technical and smart guy. If he has the ability to put things all over the internet and to reproduce things and put them all over YouTube, then certainly he has the ability to run a CD. So I'm not going to give you that. I'm not going to take that from you. If he doesn't have the ability, though, Mr. Benjamin, I do want him to have the items. So if he doesn't have the ability, and again, he's going to find out if he uses the public library if he can access a CD or if he can access, I'm sure he can access a thumb drive through any computer. But if you do not, you need to tell Mr. Benjamin you do not, and then he, I'm ordering you to produce whatever documentation, because I'm not going to, I'm not going to say he should be able to. If you cannot, you cannot. But I do believe, if you use the public library, a computer will allow you access to a thumb drive. So that I believe you can get. I have no idea about CD technology, if they still use that or if they allow you that. But you understand what I'm saying. So I'm ordering you're satisfied with the discovery unless you can't. And if you physically can't, then you need to tell Mr. Benjamin you can't, and I'm asking Mr. Benjamin to produce those documents, okay? because I want you to have everything he has ahead of time. But again, this goes the other way. I'm ordering you to provide all the videos that you plan on using to Mr. Benjamin. Email is fine. You can email them, can't you? Yes, sir. Okay. So then you need to provide that to Mr. Benjamin. If that, yeah, I'm not going to cripple somebody, because they can't do a certain way. If his way of accessing it, as long as he provides the information, the method doesn't bother me. If he's saying he can't do it one way, then he has to do it another way. As long as he gets the information to you. So I would suggest that you provide him some sort of email or some address that he can transfer those to you. He's welcome to bring it by the office. He can mail it, any of those things, any of those things. But he's saying he can't. He's saying that he is, he only has access to email. Well, Judge. Can you provide an email address? I'm not going to give him my email. I'm going to tell you why. Because he bombards my telephones. Your people call, they curse our people out, they talk and say all kinds of idiotic things. Why would I give you my email so you can jam up our system? Well, I guess that's my next question. Is there an email that you can use that you can access the information, Mr. Benjamin, that's not your personal, or your assistant's personal, or anything like that? Well, we'll figure, we'll figure it out. Okay. If he can only send something to my email, we'll, we'll figure out a way to get it, but I'm not giving him that because that's what he wants. And that's what he's been trying to do because I'm, you know, everybody's kind of tired of it. I'm not, I'm not going to tiptoe around it. What they're doing is he, he curses our people out, or his people curse our people out, calls them all kinds of things I can't even repeat here in the courtroom, continuously. Getting people's home phone numbers, getting people's, let's be real, let's be real. So I'm not going to let him, I'm not going to let him lie to the court and try to hide behind a technicality when they're doing things that are just crazy. Are you aware? That if any of these people out here did. 
Are you aware of any of this, sir? We would. Sir, I reach out, and I don't get all the feedback. If, uh, if, if there was evidence of this activity... I know we received 25 faxes one day of the same statement. They'd be locked up. ...is talking about, so I'm not aware of what Mr. Benjamin's talking about. I'm not going to speak to that. I will speak to personally. I know we've received dozens and dozens of faxes about just a statement that obviously was connected to your case. I'm not going to read it because, again, I don't want to be unduly influenced. But what I'm saying is, I'm assuming there is some truth to what he's saying. So is there a way for y'all to figure this out without, I mean, I would not want any address from the district attorney's office to be given to anybody else. The only reason I even suggested it is so that you personally could use it to give him personal, I mean, the information you plan on using. Yes, sir. I... So I would not want any, any other reason to use something like that. So is there any way y'all can figure this out? I'll create a Google the Google mailbox so he can do it. Thank you. And it takes about three minutes. That's what's, that's what's going to happen. And so that way, there is just an account. The other assumption is, this is a good test. He's going to provide you some sort of Google access. I'm assuming the only thing going to that address is communications from Travis Hines to Cloyd Benjamin. There shouldn't be any other information going there. That would mean that, in essence, you have a leak, and that other people are misusing this, and I don't want that. Yes, sir. Okay. So that will allow you the ability to transfer those by email to him. Yes, sir. I can also stop at his office to... Certainly. To receive... I'm not, I prefer not. Okay. I don't want to meet with you. If you want to send me something, you can send it. Well, can you communicate through that email address? To my email address, or communicate. I just, I just need to get it somehow. I'll give it to you. We'll... But we'll set up that email address. We'll set it up. And that way y'all can communicate that way, as a lot of people do nowadays, just email each other. So that way, y'all can communicate if there's anything you need to address. And look, the court is always available to meet with both of you. I just can't meet with any individual one of you. So if there is something that I need to, if there is a pre-trial matter, I'll be happy to accommodate and have a pre-trial on whatever issue comes up. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and assume that we'll resolve the discovery for now until next time. And then the last motion I have here is a motion to transfer venue. You have filed to transfer this to district court. What do you say about that? Well, uh, I'm not sure. I'd like to hold up. Maybe hold off on that until next. Well, I don't I am going to deny it. Okay. Because, in the reason being, and this is before I received Mr. Benjamin's motion, you had quoted the civil code of procedure. This is not a civil court. This is a criminal court today. And your matter is a criminal matter. It's not a civil matter. Now, if you decide at some point to file a civil suit, that's on you, but you cannot quote the civil code of procedure. It doesn't apply to this. The only thing that applies is a criminal code of procedure, and under the criminal code of procedure, under Article 729 to 779, you can have a jury on a misdemeanor. However, the punishment has to exceed $1,000 in fines or imprisonment of more than six months. Under 108, your maximum fine would be under 500 in your or no more than 500, and your maximum imprisonment would be less than six months. In other words, you're not eligible for a jury trial. In fact, that's why you're in this building. The only cases that come into this building are those that are misdemeanors, not trialed by a jury. Moss, you'll notice, there's no jury box. I am not eligible to have juries. So as a result, that's why your case is here. So really cannot transfer it to get a jury, because there is no jury to be had for your particular statute. If it was a different offense, possibly, but even a misdemeanor, if it's a higher grade misdemeanor, possibly, but in your situation, there is no grounds for you to have a jury trial under Louisiana law and under this particular statute. And I would argue that any jail time should be allowed. The defendant should be able to allow to have a jury trial. Oh, I get what you're saying, but that's not what the Louisiana law says. 
In Louisiana law, again, the statute says, any and all misdemeanors shall must be tried by a court without a jury if they are not in excess of a thousand dollar fine and not in excess of six months. So you're not allowed, under the law Louisiana, to a jury trial. So I'm just telling you that's the law, and that's why I'm denying your motion. It doesn't take a lot of argument for me to tell you that that's what the law is, okay, so I'm going to deny that motion. And otherwise, I think that comes to the end of your and Mr. Benjamin's motions unless I missed something. I have one more thing to discuss. I would like to request that my bail be lowered to own recognizance. Okay. Why is that? Because I'm... I'm here. Okay. And I intend to continue uh, coming to court appointments. And I want to settle this matter honorably. Okay. Okay. Mr. Benjamin? Judge, I think the court set the bond commensurate with what was presented and what the court thought it should be, based on all the first of all, he doesn't live here. Has no connectivity with the community, has no one to vouch for where he will be or where he won't be. He has no employment here in the community. Any person that came up for a bond would have to show that. Own recognizance is usually judged for someone that there is a course of dealing under Article 315, I believe it is. You know, they are available in THR community, they've been here, everybody knows them, where they live, everybody knows where they work. You know, they're just here. He is absolutely by the, by the nature of who he is by not having that address, he doesn't even have a stable address. He's transient. So he needs to put up something to assure in our opinion, that he'll come back, that he'll come back and have his day in court. Mr. Hines, he is totally accurate about why bonds exist, and they exist, usually, they encourage someone to come back. And the fact that you are not a resident of Natchitoches Parish, whether you're transient or not, you're not a resident, and as such, I'm going to leave the bond as it is. That's really why bonds exist. It's usually to compel you to come back. And even though you have come back for your court today, and I appreciate that, it is in place for that very reason. So I'm going to deny your oral motion to reduce to an OR bond. Is there any other motion you'd like to bring today? No, sir. All right. Then what I have set then in front of us is a March 7th arraignment date. In between now and then, hopefully, you'll satisfy your discovery. If there are any issues about discovery, just file a motion with this court or even contact, and I'll be happy to take those up. Judge, if he'll provide, if he'll provide me with a cell phone number, I will provide him with the information that he can electronically submit whatever he would like. That's fine. To U.S. We can do that. If that's satisfactory to you. I don't know how else you're going to get the email address. I have a, I can take calls in, but I can't take, I can't call out. I don't have a phone plan. Okay. Well... I'm going to call you, so you don't have to call me. Okay, just if you could leave a clear message. It's Google, turns it into text. Okay. I speak very well. Okay. Well, if you don't mind providing that to you don't have to provide it out loud. You can write it down. But you can provide that, and then that way... He can provide you with that Google address, and y'all can work on discovery. Okay. If there's nothing else, we'll conclude this matter. Thank you, sir. Thank you.